answering your tough financial questions for the past 26 years. It's Allworth's Money Matters with co-hosts Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. Would you like an opinion on a financial matter you're dealing with? Whether it's about retirement, investments, taxes, or 401ks, Scott Hansen and Pat McLean would like to help you by answering your call. To join Allworth's Money Matters, call now at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome to Allworth Financial's Money Matters. I'm Scott Hansen. I'm Pat McLean. Glad you are here with us as we're talking about financial planning issues. Both myself and my co-host here are both financial advisors, certified financial planner, chartered financial consultant, spend our weekdays with people like yourself. And we are here on the weekends being your financial advisors on the air. And uh, if you'd like to join us for anything that's on your mind, we'd love to take your call. Questions? Comments? Yeah, concerns? actually, not anything that's on your mind. Not anything that's on your mind. <laughs> uh, it's got to be a pretty good, it's pretty it's specific something financial. Something financial. And not your opinion either on this. So. Yeah. Yes, please. Those, those, but, but call, but yeah. call if you yeah. have a question. And to join the program, it's toll free eight three three ninety nine worth. That's toll free eight three three ninety nine worth. Numerically, it's eight three three triple nine six seven eight four. And we'd love to take your call and get you on the program. And uh, if you've been listening to this show for a while, you'll understand that. A lot of the issues that we discuss are kind of retirement related, mainly because that's what people worry about. Yeah, that's what they say for the future. Yes. There's most for most people there's gonna be a time in their life they're not working, or if they are working, they don't want to be reliant upon their paycheck. Yeah. People try to save for their children's education and retirement. Yes. Those are kind of the big those are the Well, and when you're young, it's a house, your first house. Yes. And um what else? Cars? Hopefully cars. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> well, I think this program, there's obviously programs out there, other financial shows that they're, help people with the uh, yeah, budget, they're budgeting. budgeting We're not a budgeting show. And that sort of stuff. Here's my budget for you. Spend less, make more. There you go. It's about as simple as that, isn't it? It really is. Don't spend beyond your means. And try not to finance anything that you consume in a relatively short period of time. Which includes automobiles. Yeah. Well, anything you consume. Yes. Finance over time. Correct. Do not yeah, finance that. Because now you, you're paying an interest on a declining an asset that declines in value. Yes. Never a good idea. Uh, let's uh, actually before I take this call, there's an article. I've seen a number of these articles, but this one just kind of reminded me. It's the people in their seventies that are working. And according to this study, the number of Americans working in their seventies is skyrocketing. I don't know if it's skyrocketing. Yeah, it didn't look like a skyrocket. But uh, but over the last 20 years, there's been a 50% increase in the percentage of people over age 70 working. Okay, from what to what? 50%? From what to what? From from 1% to 1.5%? No, no, from 10% to 15%. That's not a skyrocket. It's an increase. 50%. If the stock market went up 50%, you would certainly say the market is skyrocketed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, okay. <laughs> but by the way, the show is more than about uh, Pat and Scott arguing semantics. <laughs> well, if the market—if it went from fifty percent of the employee people working to seventy-five percent, that would be a fifty percent. No, but here's what I find it. So here's what's interesting about this: it's not just that headline number, but who is working in retirement? It's not the—it's not necessarily those that need the money. Which makes sense. Well, some of those are out there. Some clearly. people, some they have no options, have to work. And sometimes we'll get callers from people like this in this program. It's like you're just going to have to keep working, um, but or change your standard of living considerably. If you look at uh, those in their seventies, right? So fifteen percent of people in their in their seventies are working, but those with a bachelor's degree or higher, twenty percent of those people. And so one in five and ten. Percent of the people with high school or less are in the workforce after the age of seventy, which is part of it. I think if you if you don't have an if you're not don't have an education, you there's a good chance you might you might have to you have do, more manual 
labor in your work. Yes. Perhaps. Maybe not necessarily. But if you're, you know, but if you're, if you're a bachelor, well, look at all the professors that are over age 70. I don't know. Are there a lot of professors over age 70? I think so. <laughs> He's looking them. I don't know. <laughs> well, neither one of us know. Maybe there are a lot of professors over age 70. Here's what we know. According to studies, roughly two-thirds of baby boomers say they want to continue doing some sort of work in retirement. About half those say they want to do something new, something different. And about half? It's in the same, same career. The key is to doing work on your terms, not on someone else's terms. Because you want to, not because you have to. Yeah. And it's getting to a point where you are retirement eligible, whether or not you want to retire. Because sometimes I talk to someone and say, oh, Scott, I, ne- I, don't, I don't want to retire. I, just, I love what I do. I 50% of the, the chance of the times you're not going to have a choice in the matter. Something's going to happen. 50% of the time, you're going to leave the workforce on some factor other than your own decision. Your health, loved one's health, change in employment. Yeah, so it's really about being retired, being retirement ready. That, and that is what we talk a lot about in the program. And it's, uh, I guess it's financial independence, right? It's getting to that point in life. I mean, there's a lot of important goals in life, clearly. <laughs> but uh, that's one where you, you, you get a little more say-so as you age through life so again our number if you would like to be part of our program toll free it's 833-99 worth 833-999-6784 and let's start off in denver we're going to talk with charles charles you're with all worth's money matters hi um so i have about three thousand a month that i can invest or to set away. I don't have a house. I got a divorce. I live with my mom still. Uh, and so I have all these options, you know, Roth IRA, 401k, or put money for down payment on a house. All right. Hey, Charles? Yes. Two things. One, how old are you? I'm 53. And how much more money is there in addition to this $3,000 you can save a month? Do you have money in a 401k or IRA? Yeah. Currently, I have 150000 in the, the 401k. Okay. And I'm, I have about ten thousand in a Roth IRA. Okay. Um, All right. And, and do you have children uh, you're supporting? No, I don't. Okay. And you called to ask for our advice, correct? Yeah. Okay. I, I have a I have a parent <laughs> retirement. Uh, I mean, I'm not retired, but I have, I have about thirty four years of Colorado State. Oh, you know, so you got a pension. Retirement. So here's my yeah. first bit of advice. You said that you live with your mother. Yes. In the future, I'd like you to say that your mother lives with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds so much better. <laughs> if you ever expect to get married again, that's how I'd approach it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I gave you my advice. <laughs> uh, All right, so you've got 34 years in, uh, with, uh, presumably you're going to have a pension from uh, this job, correct? Yes. Uh-huh. And the the living situation like this will it will it probably continue for some time and might there be a, a, might you inherit the so. home in the future i don't think i want to inherit the home but um part of the home i have four brother, siblings okay, okay four siblings yeah so and how much cash do you have on hand like just plain like have you About not 30,000 <laughs> Cash. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, well, not like, like seventy two dollars, like, like in the bank, my pocket, that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't know, Scott. What do you think? I think that you should try to build the cash reserves. Well, I think getting a house at some point in time. It, it, the you, challenge when you go to here's the challenge, right? Your pay. If you look at your pay today and compare it to ten years ago or twenty years ago, it's much higher, right, than twenty years ago. Yes. Uh-huh. Right, and and rent. Right now, you're not paying rent, but rent is much higher today than it was 20 years ago. When you retire, that pension is not going to keep growing over it's, the next 10 to 20 years. It's going to remain the same level. Well, and even if it has an inflation accelerator, oftentimes the it's inflation accelerators the aren't the same as the real rate of inflation or the cost of housing. So the biggest, the biggest safeguard you can get uh, for retirement in inflation is the purchase of a home. And you're 53, and I do you plan on staying in the same area when you retire? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to stay in Denver. I would like you to buy a house. Yeah, I think I, think um, I would agree with either that. Either now or in the next couple of years, and I would set this up so that the house was paid off at around the same time you retired. So, if possible, if, if not. And if not, so 
there's a chance you won't be able to get it paid off by retirement, which is fine. Get if 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 that's the if that's kind of the plan, have a loan that you can do a what's called a reamortization on it. And not all loans allow this. So if you actually go down this path, this remember this little part of the conversation. What it would enable you to do is that retirement time is let's say you have 21 years left on the loan, it allow you to reset the your payments so that the home would be paid off over 21 years. So in other words, let's say you had a $300,000 loan, just throwing a number out there, $300,000 loan, and you say, I'm going to try to accelerate my payments for the next 12 years as I'm working, and you're making those extra payments, and you get down, now it's 12 years out, now the loan balance is $100,000, let us say. Well, if we can then reamortize that 100000 over the remaining term of the loan, that brings your payment way down. Significantly. So I think that you should either start looking for a home right now, or start saving for a home right now. And if you okay. were saving for a home right now... Well, if he's got a free place to live and it's not mine, then I would say just save for a home. Fair enough. And I would use a uh, an online bank like... Uh, just go to... Um, what's the name of that website? Um, Bankrate.com. Bankrate.com. It's- Are you contributing to your 401k now? A little bit, yeah. I'm trying to... I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> Why? Why? Right now. Well, because then I don't have as much money to put towards the down payment. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm all right with that. Yeah. So just go to bankrate.com and choose one of the online banks and high yield money market accounts and just put money. I think it's your biggest thing. We both agree on your biggest thing for financial security for your retirement. Is to own a home. And remember, you consume the home in some form or fashion. So the bigger the home, the more you're going to consume, the more it will affect your retirement. So maybe something modest. Okay. All righty. Okay. All right. All right. Appreciate the call. Wish you right. well. And you Appreciate know, Pat, it's interesting. Right. So there'd be some people that would say, I, regardless, you got to put money in your 401k. The thing that was unique w- with Charles is the pension. Yes, 34 years. And the assumption is, because he didn't mention it, I didn't ask whether his ex-wife had a uh, quadro, quadro qual- on there, which a qualified domestic relations Yeah. Order. Yeah. And but we didn't know that, but he... Quite frankly, he should probably do some financial planning. And we we have worked with many people who've gone through divorce, kind of middle stage in life. And later. And later. And it's later. never good financially. Yes. It's, I mean, it's difficult. Very, very few couples are in a financial position so strong that they can maintain their same standard of living apart. Yes. Right, even those with large assets. I mean, I think of some families that you yeah. know millions of dollars, but they go and d- divorce, and suddenly they can't each have in their own good size house and second house. It's not, and it's hard for people to land on that too. So whether it's modest assets or significant assets, it will almost all circumstances have a significant effect. Yeah. Although it didn't on Jeff Be- Bezos's wife, it appears. <laughs> Jeff Bezos. Okay. <laughs> if you've got a billion plus, forget then about you're it. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you got a billion plus, whatever. But I think I think just stating that, if you find yourself in a in a challenging marriage, go to counseling. I would invest more time and energy on that. Forget any of the other issues with kids and morals, all that other stuff. Set all that stuff aside. Just from a pure financial perspective. Because we've seen it. Yes. And here's uh, Charles, 53. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what happens. Having his mother live with him. Yeah. What did the guy, when I was a young man, he says, Scott, you always want to make sure you kiss your wife goodbye uh, when you leave for work in the morning. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to kiss your house goodbye. <laughs> kiss your wife as you leave your house in the morning. If not, you're going to kiss your house goodbye when your wife leaves you or something like that. That's, uh, that's cynicism. That uh... <laughs> Was he serious? I don't Joking. know. It was a, I didn't even get it right. It was yes. that was my attempt at humor, and it, didn't, it backfired on me. All right, let's continue on with calls here at All Worth Money Matters. All Worth, of course, is formerly Hanson McLean. You still got Scott Hanson and Pat McLean here taking the calls and at the helm, and to be part of the program. It's toll free eight three three ninety nine Worth. We're in Sacramento with David. David, you're with All Worth Money Matters. Thank you, uh, Scott and Pat. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm 67, recently retired, happily married. <laughs> and I've put 
most of my retirement funds into Vanguard Index with about a 50-50 split between equities and bonds. And I've had several people approach me about putting some of my retirement funds into fixed annuities as a way of diversification. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get your opinion on that. Did they approach you at the bank? No. Well, um, would, would you annuitize them immediately or would you? Yeah, what's the benefit to you? Yes. Why do they, these people tell you you need an annuity? Diversification. Okay. So what's inside the annuity? What's inside a fixed annuity? The same stuff well, you own. Is, <laughs> it's the same stuff you own. My limited understanding is like an insurance policy. It uh, pays off a certain amount. Um, it, my wife totally against it okay. because of bad it, press and it, well, things it, like that. So, well, Here, so, so there's, a, there's a difference. There's fixed annuities, and then there's fixed immediate annuities, and then there's index annuities, and then there's variable annuities. There's a bunch of different types of annuities. But we're going to talk about fixed annuities and immediate annuities. Right now. So if they're talking about a fixed annuity, all they're doing is talking about something that has a fixed interest rate for sometimes a period of time, sometimes not a period of time. And what they're doing is you take your $100,000, you give it to this insurance company. And that insurance company promises you a rate of return that is fixed in nature for a period of time. What does the insurance company do with that money? They don't keep it themselves. They actually go back and they invest in real bonds, estate, primarily mortgages, mortgages, primarily bonds, Most, mostly fixed income, mostly fixed income, which is exactly what 50 percent of your portfolio is now. Why do people buy the fixed annuities? Well, sometimes they buy them because they might have a little bit of guarantees on them in terms of we promise that the interest rate will never go below this. They but, might feel better than bonds because they don't fluctuate in value. They don't fluctuate in value. So you're paying someone to kind of keep you in the dark so that the bonds don't fluctuate in value. Yes, yeah. Assuming that you have a well-diversified bond portfolio, there's no reason for a fixed annuity. Now, an immediate annuity is something completely different. An immediate annuity is you buying a pension that will pay out for a fixed period of time or until your dying day or your spouse's dying day. Same thing happens there. What's the insurance company do with that money? They take and they buy bonds. That's what they do. They buy bonds, um, and they will pay that out to you for the rest of your life. Buying an immediate annuity in this environment means you're locking in a low, low interest rate for the rest of your life. You probably have no need for either. I can't imagine why you would. And are you spending any of this money that's at Vanguard? Okay. No, you have then no, even more so now. Yeah, you have no need for any of this, any of it. And I think Jack Bogle's portfolio was very similar to this when he passed away. So, yeah. 50%. 50. You're, and you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. I mean, you're absolutely fine. Um, yeah. How do they approach Jack you, though, Bogle, when you say— Jack Bogle, founder when, of Vanguard. Where do, you, where do you hang out that the in, in fixed annuity people get to approach you? Golf club. Oh, God. Ah, okay. <laughs> Got it. Got it, got it, got it, got it. That's, that's why, why I don't. There, that's, why, out. that's why I don't golf. Because <laughs> the annuity sales. <laughs> the annuity salespeople. No, no. You. No, you, I appreciate your. You have no your need advice for and straightforward approach. And yeah, I, just yeah, I would need buy a little reassurance. No, yeah, no, no, I no, wouldn't. No. Buy I wouldn't. And no. and there, are, the annuity products are so missold, and there's so many garbage products out there that I think the industry would be, the world would be better off if they didn't exist. However. There are some circumstances when they could make some sense. Sometimes an immediate annuity for someone that really wants that guaranteed monthly income, and uh, they're willing to give up control of their principal for that. And that's like buying a pension. There are times when that make that makes sense. Uh, there are times when uh, some of the the guarantees and some variable annuities years ago when they were they, they were, made sense. They were cheaper. The insurance companies didn't price them quite correctly. The, they the, were, made sense. But. The problem with annuities overall is that they're very very complicated products, and the average consumer cannot tell the difference between. Nor good can the average agent who the, sells them. They, yes, can't tell the difference between good or bad. Um, right? Even us, when people bring in annuity products that they've purchased from someone else. We have to actually get a hold of the contracts themselves, and uh, we, we pour over them to tell the clients what their options are. How do they get rid of them? It's not, it's not that simple. So, Yeah, I wouldn't bother. Enjoy the golf, though. I appreciate your advice. Thank you. All right, thanks. thanks, David. It reminds me, I had a um, – years ago, I had a client who um, 
she was single, and then she married a gentleman. Okay. Who was an annuity salesman. Okay. <laughs> right? And suddenly, this other person started coming into the, the appointments. Oh, your client's yes. new husband. Yes. Okay. And... um and you've encountered similar things over the years, right? Yeah. So yeah. all of a sudden, here's this other guy. And, of course, I'm thinking uh, Judy here. Not her name. Not her name. But I'm thinking uh, Judy is the one. I have a fiduciary responsibility to Judy. I know Judy. I care for Judy. I've got Judy's back. This guy, she may love him, but... My <laughs> <laughs> your, your responsibility I, wasn't to her no, new husband. No, no. It would take, frankly, takes you... you takes me years to warm up to that second, right? Those yeah. marriages like that. Because we've seen other... So an annuity salesman, and he would often bring up some sort of product about this company and that uh -huh. company. Fortunately, she would always look at him a little sideways. Like, and just you know, like, like, nope. Yeah, yeah kind of like, do whatever you want to do, but I've trust this firm, I trust this guy. And the, yeah. Um, but my, my, the reason I thought about this, he golfed a lot. Oh, he did? Yes, a lot. And I uh, think that might have been where he tried to strum up his business. Oh, the, uh, to drag people through 18 holes of an annuity sales pitch? Yeah. Miserable. I guess that's what it is. It's like, great shot. Have yeah, I told you about the death <laughs> benefit? <laughs> <laughs> How about we swing around to the 19th hole and have a couple beers while I cram the rest of this annuity down your throat? <laughs> is that how it works? Well, you would mentioned that a lot of people don't understand them. They're complicated. And so these equi the, the challenge is also, a lot of these products, these, and you hear us talking negative about them, a lot of these products, these equity index annuities, and these index annuities, you are locking your money up for 10, 12, 15 years in cases. I've seen longer than that. Surrender period. The insurance company... They can change the rules of the game midstream. So oftentimes they'll have, they have certain guarantees, in no, it, they, but they, they're they, provisions. They, they pitch them like this. You get stock market returns, but no downside, essentially, right? Yeah. That's kind of how they're pitched. They, they don't talk about how participation rates work and the fact that you don't get any dividends on the uh, underlying index. Most of us have been around long enough to know there's no such thing as a free lunch. So how does this happen, right? How in the world is an insurance company going to say, I'm going to give you the upside and we'll take the downside? Well, they don't. So they have, there's limitations. We'll give you upside up to, you can participate up to this amount. 40% of the market, not to exceed 10% or 12%, right? So it's a participation and a cap. And a cap on that, on what you get in the marketplace. But a lot of these contracts are written such that the insurance company can change those figures in the future. They'd have to. Because they have no idea what the cost of a put option is going to be in 10 years on an underlying index, Scott. And if you look at how, what they use in the mechanisms behind the curtain, what's the insurance company doing? Let me tell you what they're doing. Here's the big secret, kids. Here's the big secret with the insurance companies on how they do these index annuities. They take most of the portfolio and they invest, invest it in fixed income. Secure bonds. Just like the Low rest of the Low yielding bonds, the same stuff we go out and buy. They right? take the return from those bonds and they buy instruments, financial instruments that give them participation in an underlying index. And their options. They take some of the principal and use that as well. Because they know they don't have to guarantee anything for 8, 10, 12 years so that it's going to go through its cycle. So they're using options. So everything you purchase in and an index... And by the way, insurance companies, they don't... Don't think of an insurance company as taking on the risk. They're not taking on the risk. They hedge the risk. There are demonstrations that all they're doing is actually implementing a program and they're hedging their own risk. So you may be shifting your risk over to an insurance company, but the insurance company is not necessarily, they're not taking, they're also shifting that. They're risk. shifting it into the marketplace. So then it begs the question, if you believe in this strategy, which I don't, by the way, of what an index annuity does. If you believe in that strategy, why do you need the insurance company to employ that strategy? You can do it without them. I could go and buy my own options on the S&P 500. It would take a little more sophistication. Okay. It could, yeah, it would. Yes. And but, management. Yeah. If you believed in It'd that strategy. It would be strategy. much less expensive than the, what the insurance company And how does. does the insurance company pay? 
The broker, the guy at the golf course that's been cramming this. big upset upfront commission. And where do they get that money from, Scott? They, it's manna from heaven. They borrow it. They borrow it. The insurance company will actually borrow that money in order to pay the commission, knowing that if you surrender the contract early, they're going to get that money back from you for the commission that they paid to the broker. That's why there's the surrender charge there. That's why there's a surrender charge there. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> not cause, it's not because they need to lock your money up for years. Correct. They know that they're going to earn the money for a little bit every year in order to get the surrender. It's uh, so they can recoup their commissions that they just commissions paid Commissions that they paid off. Which might be 8%, 10%, 12%. And if it's a 10% commission... If it's a 10% commission, they're going to take that out a little bit every year out of your That's right. account. That's right. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Right. That's why we're not big fans of those products. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll take some more calls. We also have uh, some other good stuff to talk about. Our contact number is toll-free, 833-99-WORTH. You're listening to Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. All Worth Financials, Money Matters. We'll be right back. Can't get enough of Allworth's Money Matters? Visit allworthfinancial.com slash radio to listen to the Money Matters podcast. Do you have a financial question that needs answering? Call us at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome back to Allworth's Money Matters. I'm Scott Hansen. I'm Pat McLean. And again, our contact number to join us is toll-free, 833-99-WORTH. 833-99-WORTH, W-O-R-T-H. And if you've you looked at that strong? and you think, there's one too many letters there, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you <laughs> That's the first time you looked closely. Yeah, it was, it, I thought. It seems long. It does seem It's long. that W. It's yeah, the so only it's 99 worth. 833-99 worth, or you can always go to allworthfinancial.com. The we- allworthfinancial.com. The we- there's one letter in the alphabet that is three syllables. Right? That rest is just one. And for whatever reason, our internet protocol, someone decided to use WWW. So it just takes longer. I find it peculiar, of all things. That's the kind of thing that I think about. <laughs> is that what you think about? <laughs> that is strange. Oh, I don't know. Is... All right. All right. Let's do this. Let's talk about finance. Money. Take your there's, calls. There's a Supreme Court had agreed to take on this A case. Supreme Court or the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court. I think I started to say there's a case, but then it's... From uh, basically, it's the employees of Intel versus Intel on their 401k. Right? So, the workers at the 401k filed a class action lawsuit that had made its way to all the way to the Supreme Court. They're going to hear appeal on this. Intel is appealing, which means that um, they think they got a bad Ruling deal on the last the, on an, one. So, they're going to the final. On a lower court. They're going to go to the final court. In the final court. So what's this about, Scott? So Intel. So Intel and thought their employees are fighting over their 401k. Intel. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> Intel thought it would be a good idea to offer alternative investments in their 401k. Including hedge funds. Yeah, and it might have been the stuff that the senior management invested in or the CFO invested in, or most likely the venture capitalists. Um, might or people that were in that industry, someone may have asked, "Hey, can we get some alternatives that aren't correlated to the U.S. stock market or international stock market or bond markets? Can you give us an alternative?" So they obliged and they added some alternatives. The 
challenge is they underperformed <laughs> the stock market uh, significantly, and they were higher in cost. But I don't think that that I don't think that that should matter. I think that what what's going to happen in the future, Scott, when we look at the four hundred one ks. Many large companies have what are called self-directed brokerage windows or self-directed brokerage accounts. And I believe Intel does. And I thought Intel did. I think they do. So they do have it. That is correct. So if you're an employee and you look at the list of funds that your employer offers, you think, I don't like any of these. You can direct your account outside of the Intel 401k while still remaining inside the Intel 401k. How does that work? Well, many of these large 401ks and even small ones for that, uh, for that matter, uh, because you see these oftentimes at law firms or investment advisory firms where the, you have a window to go and open up an account at Charles Schwab or Fidelity or E-Trade or TD Ameritrade. TD Ameritrade or any of those where you then have their menu to choose from thousands and thousands and thousands of different. It's not some pre-screened list like in your 401k. Like in your 401k. So, when this stuff and happens, by, by the way, if you're if you have a four hundred one k and you're not too pleased with your options, just or you think I wish I had, ask if it's available. I think last I looked, the, the majority of not high, but fifty some odd percent of four hundred one k plans had a brokerage option. Brokerage, yeah. it's a brokerage window. They call them self directed brokerage accounts yeah, or S- brokerage windows. SDBA, self directed S- brokerage account or brokerage window. So you can you can say you know what I don't like the options they've got. I'm going to use this brokerage window. The, one of the challenges that, that you tend to pay much higher transaction fees than you would other places. But that's your choice. It's the only option you've got because it's in that 401k. But it might cost you 30 bucks or something to buy a fund. It's, but it's something you might say, you know, on an annual basis, I'm going to transfer my balance out from these funds I don't like into my brokerage window and buy some other funds that I would prefer. So this is now at the Supreme Court because someone was happy with the choices that were provided in their company 401k. Um, I they hope were in- happy. They were unhappy. They, I'm sorry. They were unhappy that were provided. I hope Intel wins this. I hope Intel wins it. Well, because here's the challenge with if they lose, which they've lost up until now. Yes. And here's what we've, we've seen happen with the 401ks. So 401ks have less options today than they used to have. And they're much more plain vanilla. Because... The plan who wants sponsors. To be, who wants to be in this? Yeah. It's just a fringe benefit you're Intel, offering your. Intel doesn't want to be involved in this business of providing investment advice to their client, to their employees. Believe me. No company we, does. We have a 401k in our own company, and we have a, a, a division in our company that, that puts 401ks in small companies. No employer, including me, Wants to provide a 401k. It is the dictate of the marketplace that requires you to. You mean you don't want to provide one? If I, Scott, if if every employee could self-direct outside oh, and there yeah, was another rather, mechanism yeah, yeah, of, of doing it, it w- would you not? Of course, if there was some other option where you didn't have to be involved in it. Where you didn't have to be involved. It's the same with health insurance as well. If there was some other option, yeah, 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 yeah. If the if the market, you're not saying it, you don't want the employees to participate. Oh no, I want the or employees, or you don't want to contribute to their 401k. I just don't want to take responsibility for it as their employer. Yeah, particularly for, the employees that aren't that happy to begin with. Not that we have any of those. I'm sure every yeah. one of our employees. And if they are unhappy employees, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we were um, voted best place to work in Sacramento, 2018, 17, 17. In, yeah. And for a medium-sized company, and in the consistently in, in an internal poll, we get voted. Not an internal poll. It was, a, but, it was quite the accolade. But what you've seen happen over the last number of years is companies have uh, many companies have less options than they used to, and I, apparently through the brokerage window, as you must sign some. I, I, I guess an employee to release signs the liability to not hold the company responsible for your investment decisions. They might have told them on this thing too. For all I, I know. know, just because you sign a release doesn't always mean anything, does it? No. I don't know. There we go. All right. Let's uh let's go to the phones. Again to join the program, 833-99 worth. Toll free 833-99 worth. Let's talk to Stephen. Stephen, you're with All Worth Financials Money Matters. Yes, Scott and Pat. Thank you. 
Thank My you. My question is, could you tell me is the, the best way how to do the research to find the figures if you would like to apply for your Social Security retirement benefit under the hopefully, well, the elevated levels of an ex-spouse? But, but, but you, how do you find that information when, if the ex-spouse oh, will not work with you? Yes. So this is not the first time we have had uh, this question, which is, can, w- 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 when am I eligible and should I apply against my ex-spouse's Social Security benefit? So you have a reason to believe that 50% of her benefit will be larger than your own? Yes. What is your benefit? I, How old are you today, I, Stephen? I, I'm, I'm, I'm 65 and a half. I'm getting ready. And, and you, what will your benefit be? Approximately, uh, 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 my latest statement, approximately 1901 or so. And you believe your spouse's, your ex-spouse, excuse me, will be... Th- 50% of hers will be higher than $1,900 a month? $3,800 a month? Well, maybe you can just answer my question. Maybe my question is easy to be answered. I believe I know for the last ten years or so, she's earned approximately fifteen to eighteen thousand more than I have. Oh, got per it. Year. Got it. Got it. So that that's so, why that's why I question. So how long have you been divorced, Stephen? We've been divorced thirteen years. And how long were you married? Uh, thirteen years. Okay, so there. I would bet millions well, of dollars. Here, here's that, so the maximum income for Social Security for a normal retirement age, 2019 is 2861 a month. Okay, so you're entitled to Stephen the greater of your benefit or 50 percent of your spouse's or in this case divorce spouse benefit. Yeah, due to the fact that it was 13 years ago and you yours were only is, married is, for 13 years. Yours is better. Yours is, yours is much better. Much, much better. Don't do any more research. You did all the research you need to do. Just apply on your own Social Security benefit. Just on my own. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah. Because right. the, 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 you weren't married that long, and that all comes into play, and it was 13 years ago. And her making $15,000 more per year, even in those years, isn't a significant no. enough number. Um, if you had told me— no, it would have to be, you, you, The you, bottom line is—, is we know that your benefit is greater That's than fifty percent of her benefit because the maximum benefit is twenty eight hundred bucks, and it would have okay. to be thirty nine something. Yeah, thirty eight oh two, and it's not going to be thirty eight oh two because it oh. sees the maximum benefit. So your benefit is higher, and I would bet oh. I would bet fifty percent of my net worth. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that would be comfy. <laughs> well, this is based upon the information he's provided you over the telephone. Right? Correct. So, a okay. Caveat there. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate it. I appreciate call. it. It's like, well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I'm going to bet you. <laughs> I'm You're not a betting man either. I know. Actually, I don't like to gamble at all. I find it boring I, and. I don't understand it. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. Um, I have, one of my sons is a big sports better. Well, I don't know. Big in our family is I, sometimes he, he knows that I don't encourage that behavior. So my son likes to play poker. Oh, he does. Yeah, he does online, but he it's really because I have a, a little concerned because he's twenty one, and I've counseled him a few times. Like, don't start betting in your like real real money here because you can find yourself in a problem. Yeah. What did he say? Yes, Dad. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that's great. Yes, Dad. That's great advice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dad. As I'm telling him, I realize. Yeah, and don't don't vape. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. Don't try into that uh, legal marijuana in yeah. California either. Yes, son. and marry a good woman. <laughs> <laughs> and all that advice. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> the teenagers there, open arm. Yeah, as I'm telling him, I'm realizing. Although I think he's getting to the age where he's, I mean, every once in a while he comes and asks me for my advice. Oh, well, actually, one of my sons, when I give this conversation, he's kind of a smart actor. He reaches over and he'll pat me on my shoulder and say, good talk, Dad. <laughs> nice. Thanks. So Appreciate that. I'm getting real emotional. About he reaches over, smacks you on there. Once in my chest, we were driving, he taps me on my chest. Great talk, Dad. <laughs> You you just like you you wait till you have your own kids. Man. I'm gonna be laughing. Oh gosh, when you're freak, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're coming down to the final. My my uh, youngest goes to college in August. We're uh, 
The final lap here. All right. Quarter final m- the final quarter mile. Which he has told us he's told he wants to live someone else for the summer. Because uh, they, 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 he told me the dreaded notepad where I leave the list of chores every morning is getting old. Well, maybe it's working then. Oh, it might be. <laughs> I don't want him to live with you forever. <laughs> it might be. Grow up and get out. Well, I told him you can move out anytime you want. If you'd like to join Allworth's Money Matters, our contact number, 833-99-WORTH. It's toll free, 833-999-6784. We're in Northern California talking with Manuel. Manuel, you're with Allworth's Money Matters. How you doing this morning? Good. How you doing? Okay. I'm curious about a s- various strategies for uh, starting to withdraw funds in retirement from taxable accounts, IRAs, et cetera. Okay. okay. I'm trying to, you know, I know I could take money out of my IRA, my 401ks, and but I also have a taxable account. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out. Are you retired now? Yes. How old are you? 67. How big is your uh, uh, IRA and your 401k? Uh, it's substantial. But, so here's why. Let me tell you why I'm asking the question. Because when you asked about strategies, there's a number of strategies to, 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 to go about doing this. And one of them may not actually be you actually can, taking money from the IRA or the 401b but converting it to a Roth IRA based upon required minimum distributions at age 70 and a half. So you take that account right. balance and then you put a growth rate on it and determine what the RMD is at age 70 and a half, or it could be age 72 based upon the pro- proposed legislation and then figure out whether you should actually be taking money out of that or converting that to a uh, Roth IRA, depending upon what you need to live on. And then spending right. the taxable the account. So, let, so you asked for a strategy. Let, let, I'll just explain it, how we do it here at Allworth for our clients, right? Because it's not, it's not like any, it's it's not a simple answer. Because what what we look at is with our clients is first of all we look at all the assets. What are all the assets? Everything. What's like, and if we have a if we own some mutual fund for years, what's our what's it worth today? What's our cost basis? Kind of look at all those things. So we look at all of our assets, look at what income we currently have, what's our taxable income coming in, like what's some of the fixed income, if there's any pension or Social Security. Look at what our future is going to look like with required minimum distributions, if that's going to be a problem or not going to be a problem. And then do some projections, not just this year, but the next 20 years out. Because if you look at, for example, if you if you say, I'm not going to touch my IRA and 401ks till I have to, You'll have lower tax, taxation today, but you'll probably trigger higher, higher taxation tomorrow. So really, it's looking at all these things combined. Then it's looking at just probabilities, looking down the road, right? using some assumptions of growth and some assumptions of tax law. And then yeah, that determines what the income is for 2019. And then for 2020, you typically every year kind of, kind of go through that process and say, does it make sense? Should we take a little more from our, our IRA this year? Should we sell something in our brokerage account? And not take money from the IRA? Are, are we giving money to charity? Does it make sense to actually either gift uh, appreciated assets into charity? and Maybe then use a donor advised fund and not gift for the next few years and use that to fund our it, obligations? Or uh, do we do that? And then at age 70 and a half, do we actually take our required minimum distributions and start using those dollars to go to charities, directly to charities? So the we can talk about so strategies. Yeah, so how far in the future do you look? Oh, you want to go... 100 years until you're 100 yeah, or 95? Yeah, you could go out pretty far. You want at least uh, a good 10 years visibility. Yeah. You want at least a good 10 years visibility. But it's a, it's a when you talk about strategies, I mean, it's a it, it's dependent it's dynamic. Upon, yeah, it depends on what your situation and where the assets are. And I know you don't want to talk about the assets because I asked you how big is the 401k and IRA, and you said substantial. You, 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 you would be well served by talking to a, a good financial advisor that helps people in retirement to go so, through this. Someone yeah. who's well seasoned at this. Yeah. Yeah. So all right. You know, and, and but it's, when you said substantial, is that a million, two but million, see, five so million? So here's what million? here's what's common. Well, I don't even know what's common because it's every situation's unique. Some people get retirement. 
they have a, a, a large 401k or IRA and really nothing else than any, any other assets. So there's not a lot of strategy going on there. It's just figuring out what's the right amount to take on a monthly basis. Some people at retirement, they've got money in a Roth. They've got money in, in, in tax-deferred IRAs and 401ks. They have some money in a brokerage account. They've got a rental. They've got all these different things going on, and it's very dynamic. And it might be that we have some... Sometimes, for example, at someone 67, we have dollars coming out just from a brokerage account to meet our monthly needs, and we convert a certain amount from a IRA to a Roth be, be, because it doesn't make sense to spend that money because we have all this other money and that we've that it's already been taxed. It's kind of like being a, it's, it enables us to shovel a bunch of money into a, a Roth IRA that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. So it's very dynamic if you've got multiple assets at retirement. And let's continue, and we're going to talk with Mark. Mark, you're with Scott Hansen and Pat, Pat McLean of Allworth Financials Money Matters. Hello, my name's Mark. Um, I have my ideal um, age to retire. I believe is sixty six point six or point four. Uh, uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark. That's pretty precise. So are you saying according to Social Security? Uh, yes. Okay, because some people's ideal age to retire is in their twenties or thirties. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you're I've talking about once. Okay. <laughs> you're talking about when you're a hundred percent of your social security benefit becomes payable, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Just clarification. Continue there. on. The question I have is I believe if I retire before that age, I will have to they will withhold or I'll have to pay is it one dollar for every two that I make? Uh, so you're talking about if you collect Social Security and you continue work, either self-employment right. or some sort of wage income. Yeah, there are, are earnings limits between um, it's, from age 62 through the year in which you, full, you reach your full retirement age. Then there's different limits on the year you reach your re full retirement age until that date, that's several months until you reach your full retirement age. And then after that, you can earn as much as you'd like. Yeah, and it's your full retirement age is not the same as your ideal retirement age, but uh, it's full retirement when 100% of the social okay. Well, then the key is just simply don't take Social Security until you hit that full retirement age if you're still working. And then watch it for the year as if you're, if you're going to take it that year. So what's the driver here, though? What, what's driving this? Well, um, I used to have a very – I used to have a much higher income, including my – uh, rental investments. Uh, I cut it back the last two years, but um, because of the business. But it'll it'll pick back up, and I definitely will uh, have a large sum uh, withheld, if not all of the Social Security benefit. Just for income so taxes, you mean? I can. Yes, sir. How old are you today? I'm 63. Okay. Yeah. So if you collected Social Security today. You only earn about what twelve or thirteen. 14, yeah, it's, it's fourteen thousand yeah, bucks a year. Yeah, for every two dollars yeah. you earn above that, you lose a dollar's worth in benefits. So it'd be make no sense whatsoever to to sign up for it today. Your best bet is either uh, signing up the year in which you reach your full retirement age, or probably it's actual the date you reach your full retirement age, whatever that month is in your birthday year. All righty. And and my wife has been drawn uh, disability. Uh, she's had MS for 36 mm, years. Sorry about that. And when she hits that same age, in our case, uh, can she then go to my and pick up my retirement instead of her? If if uh, if fifty per, if fifty percent of your benefit is greater than her disability benefit, then yes. Otherwise, she'd be better off sticking on her uh, her disability benefit yeah. until she she's eligible for her. Right. Social Security at her full retirement age. Right. All right. Alrighty. That's what. That's what I assumed. I uh, went to a couple of the different things, talking about Social Security and didn't. Wouldn't answer my question unless we made Well, Mark, we also on our on our website at allworthfinancial.com, we've got a great uh, Social Security tutorial. I I don't know if it's a webinar or I think it might be in a few different things. Anyway, you can learn as much as you'd like to on Social. It's Security. great according to who, Scott. Me. Okay. I think, right. I think a, there's, either, well, there's one of us that did the uh, voice behind it all. You so. were the foremost authority on your own content. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We, well, were voted, we were voted number one in an internal poll. <laughs> it would be bummer if we were number two in an internal poll. <laughs> then you know you've got a work problem. <laughs> Actually, you know, 
we were we were uh, voted the number one uh, place to work in uh, the Sacramento region for a medium sized employer. Yes, of all industries, I was quite. Proud. And we were voted by our employees. We didn't vote. No, we weren't allowed to that one. So I can. I personally voted to say we've got a great tutorial on our website. Yes, that you can personal. say that. Yes, but yeah. Anyway, we are running short on time, and we are starting something extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's not extraordinary. <laughs> something new. new for our new our, for you, our podcast listeners. Ordinary, not extraordinary. Ordinary. So if you're this, a podcast listener, this is what we're going to do. This this program, by, by the way, we've been doing it for 24 years. I'm getting old. Uh, broadcast uh, primarily through broadcast radio, but we started launching on podcasts a couple years ago as well, and we have lots of podcast listeners. And so we thought we would start adding some periodically, adding something extra for our podcast listeners. So if you don't listen to our podcast, you may want to start. Yeah, and just go to our website, All Worth Financial, and um, you will you can get a link to it there. Or just go to iTunes and look at All Worth Financial's Money Matters. And what is that something special? Or is it Money Matters from All Worth Financial? It's one of those two, Money Matters. So it's not that hard to find. I, go- I Googled it myself the other day. I Googled Money Matters. I went to, not Google, I went to iTunes, did Money Matters, and... So you right can there. email... It's you- All, Worth's, All Worth's Money Matters You can you find. You can email us your questions... And we will try to answer them in some form or fashion on the After Hours podcast. Yes. Kind of a broad topic question, not like, uh, yeah. you know, should I increase my small cap exposure from 8% so, to so 10%? things that are uh, of interest to the general podcast listening public. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. So, exactly. Uh, so send your questions to questions at moneymatters.com, questions at moneymatters.com, and we will address those questions. And um, on this podcast, if you are listening now, we will continue, once this is over with our radio, to have a uh, uh, Roger had sent us a question, and we're going to deal with that. So unfortunately, we're out of time for our radio broadcast, and we are here every week at the same station, so hopefully you turn in next week. And if you haven't been to our website lately, allworthfinancial.com, there's some great education tools there I think would be of help to you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week. This has been Scott Hansen and Pat McLean, All Worth Money Matters. This program has been brought to you by All Worth Financial, a registered investment advisory firm. Any ideas presented during this program are not intended to provide specific financial advice. You should consult your own financial advisor, tax consultant, or estate planning attorney to conduct your own due diligence.